Good morning. So, Gladys and I were talking at coffee a few minutes ago um, <clears throat> about something that she has observed and I have observed, which is that people who do this kind of work overwhelmingly find it a calling. Um, very few of us do it for the prestige and high salaries. Um, and I think that matters. And so before we get into the substance of the conversation, I'd like to ask each of you to say a few minutes, uh, take a few minutes and say whatever you'd like to say about who you are and what you do and why you do it and why you find yourself sitting here with all of us. Well, first of all, well, my name is Gladys Muhammad and I'm from South Bend, Indiana. And I've been working in the community, I would like to say, my whole life. And I, I do it because I feel, in reflecting back on my life, that I was born to do this work. This is my gift. And this is what, and I will say, this is what the power within me, God wants me to do. Because many times I would say there are some things I'm not going to do. I'm tired. I'm sick of this. But I find myself doing it anyway. So I feel like my path is directed. And this is the work that I should be doing. And Miss, the lady that just spoke, she took me back, way back, talking about the connection between slavery and today. And now I know better than I knew already. This is what I was born to do. Because she mentioned the Juneteenth celebration. I play Harriet Tubman in the Juneteenth celebration, which is going to happen in South Bend on Saturday when I go back. And I am who I am. They live in me. The slaves live in me. And I also feel that they direct my path to be who I am today. And I really appreciated that speech that she just made. And I feel honored to be sitting here in the midst of all of you that do this work. So thank you, David Kennedy, for inviting me here to share my own life and experiences with you today. Thank you. When wisdom speaks, she just draws me in. So I was just listening and watching her back there. Um, I'm Tashante McCoy Ham. I'm from Stockton, California. Hey, I know we got some Stockton folks out there. Um, I wanted to be a teacher. You know, I was a teacher actually. My aspiration was to start in early childhood education and work my way all the way up to being a college professor, believe it or not. Um, and then tragedy struck and struck and struck. So when I think about the question that he asked, I'm like, God literally called me to this. And um, many times I find myself thinking the same thing. Like, I don't know, this is too much. It's too much pressure. It's a lot of heartache and heartbreak. Um, and disappointments that come along with it. But then I, too, find myself drawn back in. Um, and this morning, so much so, we have a prayer line that has taken place in Stockton. It's 5 a.m. in Stockton, so, but it's 8 o'clock here. And this morning when I was on, the, um, on that line, the, lady, the, the, the young lady who was praying, she spoke specifically to um, operating in the vein of God and, and what, your pur what his purpose is for you in your life. And to be asked that question right after going through um, that um, prayer that was so specific is it, definitely um, a, a calling. And my mom always tells me that I'm her golden child. Um, don't tell my siblings. No one's recording this, right? Um, which comes with a lot of pressure. <laughs> Hey, mom, um, which, it, which comes with a lot of pressure. 
but I look at that as that that calling over my life to bring forth the message and bring the voices um, of our people into the room and in spaces like this. Uh, my name's Jesse Janetta. Uh, I work at the Urban Institute in Washington, D.C. in our Justice Policy Center. Uh, that is a social policy research organization primarily. Uh, my start in getting involved in any way uh, with the kind of work that we're here to talk about began when I was an undergraduate at the University of Michigan. Uh, I had, hey, oh, who knew, all right. Um, and I had the opportunity uh, through involvement in a program there to go into uh, men's prisons in southeastern Michigan to do theater work and creative writing work. I had never set foot in a prison. I really hadn't thought much about what prisons were or who was in them. Um, but I think through the work with the men there and starting, as many people did, thinking about reentry, which is often sort of a gateway drug to reform, um, thinking about why the men were there who were there, why they were being taken from communities like Detroit, like Benton Harbor, like Flint, and sent to communities like the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, where I'm from, and thinking about where there was an opportunity for me as I was starting to you know, deepen my analysis of what was going on with mass incarceration to make a contribution. More and more uh, over my involvement, uh, there have been people at the table in policy conversations saying uh, the people closest to the problem are closest to the solution. And I think one of the challenges in the work that I do and working in an organization like Urban, we're not the closest to the problem. And so that means thinking about exactly how we relate to the solution, but I think part of the work is thinking about how we can, in fact, from a research and policy perspective, make a contribution to building knowledge and advancing towards a solution, supporting those who are closest to the problem. Good morning. It is now. Yes, now it is morning. Yesterday it was not. So good morning. Um, my name is Tony McNeil. I'm from Stockton, California. Um, and I'm a community organizer um, by trade and by call. Um, I am um, an, an, a clergy. Um, I'm an elder at my church. I'm an elder in the community. Um, I'm an elder in the neighborhood on the, <laughs> on the street. Um, and um, for sure called, I hear that a lot. Um, this is definitely something that you are called to if you're not, if you don't have a call, if you don't have this inner voice and pool that is driving you to do this work, then you won't last. Um, that is an absolute assurance. Um, I am definitely called and what I believe for sure sitting here is that I have been being prepped all the days of my life, um, coming backstage um, from playing violins and, you know, performing and doing different things on stage, learning how to get comfortable in spaces like this. It took a long time. Um, and so I'm shocked in one instance, but on the other side, I'm not because I can now see right here in this moment that I have been prepped and prepared all this time to be in a space such as this in order to use my voice which can be very loud, and I'm working really hard on using my inside voice right now. <laughs> yes. Um, but to use my voice to speak on behalf of people that will never have the opportunity to sit in this space in this time and use their voice. Um, so I speak on behalf of my father, on behalf of my brother, on behalf of my brothers and sisters in the community, um, on behalf of those that are in my congregation, their church, those that I organize with in the community. Um, I sit, I talk to them. Um, I make sure that when I speak, I represent them and everything that's being said. So I count it a privilege and an absolute honor to sit here amongst all of you great, wonderful um, individuals today. And I look forward to seeing where this direction is going to take us. So I will say with sincerity that the honor is ours. Glad you're here. Um, 
I will say to Tashante that personal experience will demonstrate that having become a college professor does not mean you know how to teach. <laughs> um, and I'm not above a cheap thrill school. Can I just say I'm from Michigan too? Okay. <laughs> Um, so I was also really moved by what Maisha Braden just said, and I, Tony, I think we will make our way to, to some of those areas. Um, but I don't want to start there. I want to start not where we often do with police community relations and certainly not with, with police, but with community. Um, so... When I opened yesterday, one of the things that I, I said um, that I believe to be true and that, that I want to explore, um, and because I speak for the national network here that I am committing the national network to, is um, articulating for those who do not get it that communities are not dangerous, um, that communities may have issues uh, they may have people at high risk in them, but communities are not dangerous. And I want to keep that conversation amongst the three of you as community members for a bit before I bring Jesse in. Um, Jesse and I are also community members, but not the kind of community members we usually mean when we say community members. And maybe there's a sermon in that too, and maybe we will get to that. Um, but what I said yesterday was, despite all of the deliberate damage that has been done to the affected community, about which Maisha Braden was eloquent, and despite all the things that have been, been not done out of neglect for the affected community, uh, which when you put those things together is a, a, a litany of sin and supremacy and violence and abuse. That despite all of that and without any correction and support from the outside, it is, it is a fact that communities conduct themselves, govern themselves, raise their kids, deal with each other, so that they, in fact, do the overwhelming work of producing public safety. Public safety is not produced by the state. It is not produced by folks with guns and badges, although there's a role for that, perhaps. But the heavy lifting, the core work of, of public safety is done by communities. And having said that and, and going to um, the grouping that followed in this place yesterday, Eric Cumberbatch and others were eloquent in saying that in the purposeful, deliberate, additional work of producing public safety through program and funding and, and activism and mechanism, um, he wants the community to be in the forefront of that deliberate work, not the traditional powers of the state and the criminal justice system. Um, so let's start there. As you, as you think about what scholars call informal social control, which is, is the everyday work of, of community and family and, and uh, self-governance, and what communities might do in addition to enhance public safety. What do you think about that? Where is your community? Where is the sort of state of the thinking and the work that, that you see and that you do? And who would like to start? <laughs> um, one thing that I can say about the, our community in Stockton is very diverse. Um, it's very unique, um, period. Just, it's a very special place. There used to be a sign that says someplace special when you drive into Stockton, because it truly is. Um, for me personally, it was a, making a connection um, with Chief Jones in our area was very um, interesting, the way that um, it took place. Um, 
upon, we met at a Survivor Speak conference, which um, was led by the organization that I work for. And he had just began to get involved with the um, national initiative work and was on stage speaking about um, how he had the desire to connect with community. So I was like, oh, my spidey senses went up. Like, oh, okay, we in the same community. I'm gonna go get in his business. Um, and I did just that. And the journey that we went on um, and began with acknowledging um, harm to our family directly by not receiving the services that we um, felt, or not even felt, that would be necessary for an individual who um, lost a loved one to a homicide. And really having to go back and look into um, our case with my brother and realizing that they did nothing right, made no connections, and then having to call and tell us that, and, and then asking us if we wanted to go back and redo everything, it was just, it, it was just crazy, for lack of a better word, um, that part of the journey. But after going through that and seeing um, the accountability on their behalf, it just began a journey of reconciliation and healing that has brought so many other individuals to the table and into the space to begin the same process. Um, that's my little tidbit, you know, to, to get us started. <laughs> okay. I, um, when I started working as a community organizer, I worked on the west side of South Bend, Indiana, in a neighborhood that had been disinvested in for 35 years or 40 years because of bank redlining and lending practices that was not about to give us any money. But we had 11 murders in one month in this neighborhood. It was a notorious neighborhood. We called it the block. And people came from Detroit and Ben Harbor and Gary and Chicago to the block to do whatever they wanted to do. And when, when they had those that many murders, they, we said enough is enough. So what we did, we got all of the people who lived in the neighborhood to come together. It was their neighborhood. They live in it. And if anybody was going to change it, they had to change it because the powers that be was not going to change it. At the time, the feeling was that this is where it all was at. Just go over there and pick them up. If you want to arrest somebody, go to the block. Our feeling was that this is where we live, this is where we work, and we need to clean it up, and we need to push it out of this neighborhood. And the powers that be felt that it should stay there because that's where it all was going on. We just said, no, we just hosting it. It's going on all over the city, and you want to put it all on the west side. So we did things to make the neighborhood change, but we also had to work with the police. That was their job to solve crime. Our job was to clean up the neighborhood. And so I, we established a relationship with the police in a positive way because some of them had gotten tired too. Some of them hadn't got tired. So let me put it like this. You got some good ones that do their job well, and then you got some that feel like we the problem. And so over a period of time, we did clean up that neighborhood, working with the police. But a lot of things did happen trying to clean up that neighborhood. That's when I found out some of them was good and some of them was bad because a lot of the pressure got put on us. And we fought and we struggled so over a period of time, that neighborhood did get cleaned up. But for me, public safety is everything. It's not just law enforcement. It's dirty things all on the street and cans and everything that sometimes we contribute to. And we had to, uh, we had a vision. We had to see a vision. We had to see the neighborhood clean. We had to believe that it was going to happen. And, and over a period of years, again, it did happen. But I learned, I met a lot of police officers. I worked with them. Some of them, we worked well together. Some of them, I had to say what I had to say. 
But I, I just believe that public safety is everything. And over the years, I've had lots of experiences working in the neighborhood. So thank you. <laughs> um, when you said, David, community, um, initially, when I hear community, I immediately think of my neighborhood. I immediately think of where I live, where I reside. However, there was something that you said that really stood out to me. When you say community, and this is just how I processed it, when you say community and I say community, we are literally perceiving two totally different entities. It is not the same, which makes me then wonder what community really means. What, what is community? Um, and so as we were, as I was listening, I was looking around the room um, and my ideal perception of community would look like this room. This room is amazing to me. Um, the diversity that is in this room um, from race, gender, age, just everything. It is amazing. This is an absolute eclectic room. Um, and it's calm and it's peaceful. Um, you know, and the education levels are different. The backgrounds are different. Um, but there is no real schism in it and to, to abide and exist in this space. That's not what my community is like. That's not what the community is. And I've never experienced that in community. However, I know it can exist. So when, when we're talking about community, the community that I see in my mind um, is a little convoluted because we do need law enforcement in our community in order to keep and uphold the law However, we also need the members of the community to function. However, the members of the community need all the right tools in order to function. And, and, and none of that is equal when you have two different perceptions of community. So for me as an organizer, what I'm finding that I'm having to do is a lot of groundwork, foundational work. I've got to go in. And first, build up hope where there just is none, if we just are really honest, um, with systems that have just failed us over and over again um, as a people in the communities that, that, that are diverse, that are really lacking, the communities that, that we, can, um, we can paint pictures of. So there's a lack of hope. There's a lack of investment. There's a lack of belief. And every now and again, someone comes in, you know, with the cape and, 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 and you know, the hero stuff. And we're going to do something different. And there might be a little bit of hope. But in the generation that we're dealing with now, that hope is rock bottom. Pretty much rock bottom. So to come in and just sell anything, it's very, very difficult. So what we're having to do from a faith-based organizing is just from the ground level. Really, really invest in leadership in the community. So for those that others are not, um, they're looking at as, say, the problem, we're looking at for the solution. And then spending a significant amount of time um, in leadership development, learning how to articulate what is it that you would like to say, putting people in spaces with individuals that they wouldn't otherwise speak to or talk to, and letting them tell their stories, um, and then share what it is that they believe that they need in order to make a change, and generational change. In other words, if I, I'm, I'm 50, um, I'm proud of it, by the way. And so as a 50-year-old, Tashante and I, we interact, and Tay is um, a little younger than me. I won't say her age, I'll let you say it. Um, but that generational thing, um, I shouldn't be, you know, um, necessarily combating with her for whatever track or lane that she's in, but there is something to be invested and poured into her. And then she has something to pour into those that are under her. And creating the responsibility, I'm responsible for her. If she's not successful in my community, then I have a role to play in that. There is something that she's lacking that I failed to give her. And so we're trying really hard to create a, um, a sense of responsibility all over again in our neighborhoods, in our community, through leadership development, through organizing um, with those that care. Because the truth of the matter is, 
the majority of the people in the community care about the people in the community. Let me, let me stick with this for a second and then I'll, I'll um, aspire to bring to Sanjay and Gladys in. So, um, one of the things that Maisha Braden said, which of course is true, is that where there are troubled communities in the phrase that we have been taught and have used for a long time, um, that's not an accident, that was deliberate. And where there are troubled communities, troubled, troubled communities exist because white folks made troubled communities. Um, and one of the markers for progress on this is that in Stockton and elsewhere, people who are white and in positions of power and privilege are beginning to get that and say that out loud. Um, and again, I hope we'll make our way to that. But um, since that's the case, I would ask you as you think about your, your vision of the community that is not and that you would wish to be, and as you do the work every day that you're doing to try to move from where we are to someplace close to that, um, and because I really liked Maisha's phrase, which she kept coming back to, which if I'm remembering right, was by birth and natural right. Um, what would you say that your community deserves and should expect by birth and natural right? I'm laughing because that's just a loaded question. That's huge. What would I say? Wow. So I always challenge people to use their prophetic imagination. David, you asked a question that makes my heart just um, emotional. That's a loaded question. How do I answer a question when I've never had the answer to imagine? How do I say where we need to start if we've never had a start to begin with? Um, my goodness. Equal playing field? I know it's presumed that we have it. However, when we said redlining, the more that I'm learning, if my community then was redlined and resources in your community I never even had access to, then once by law that's removed, but those resources in abundance aren't poured back into the community so that mine and yours look the same. Knowing that I have no access to those resources, I have no way to tap into those resources. My community will never be able to actually balance out. So that's, that's, a, that's a loaded question when we say, um, what is it we want to restore? How do we restore that which never was? How do I imagine something to be reconciled with which never foundationally started as, 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 as a real tangible relationship? Um, I even, I actually tremble at the term, um, I don't care for the term white privilege. I know that it exists. Um, however, I also know that that it's not something that was created by individuals in this space. I do believe that supremacy exists and that all of us are now attempting to actually wrap our minds around the damage of it and what actually transpired and took place historically that created this big gulf between all of us so, so laws and entities can't even, uh, community people can't even exist together. But to imagine I don't know, I would have to sit at the table and speak to someone in order to actually know, how do I imagine what a steak tastes like if I've never really had a steak? All I can imagine that steak to be is the best chicken I ever ate. <laughs> uh, 
I, my father grew up in Mississippi. And I heard Mississippi stories most of my life. And I heard how he told me how they grew up in Mississippi when the laws were against all black people in Mississippi. And my father died a few years ago. He was 103. And he had a big influence over my life. And also I have is 17 of us. So I, it's 11 girls and six boys. And my father always told me that nobody was born, that God let people be born in this world because they were somebody and that they were supposed to be free. And I feel like I was born free. Whether or not this community or this system allowed me the freedom that I should have had, I had it when I was born and I'm gonna have it when I leave it. And that's just how I feel. Institutionalized racism has slain our people and they bought into it. And I feel like we have internalized the oppression and we are self-destructing. And if anything gonna get out of that self-destruct, we gotta get our own selves out of it. They ain't gonna do it. And I, in the privilege, White people do have privilege. They have so much privilege that they don't even know when they're being racist. And it's up to us to help them understand that we can no longer allow this to continue in our community. We do this work because we want a future. We don't want a future for our children. And I don't want to preach, but I, it is painful. It's painful. And they'll say, we got an inferiority complex. No, you got the inferiority complex. <laughs> and, and I feel we do this work in our community because we have to make the change occur. It's our freedoms that's at risk. It's our freedoms that are at risk. And I just feel that deep down. And we got to believe it. We got to see it. We got to see it. We got to feel it in order to change it. And, and that's just how I feel. I'm going to stop because I don't want to cry. <laughs> because I got to be able to fight. And if I, I'm going to work with the police and anybody else that's going to do the right thing to help our communities live a life, to help our children have a life for tomorrow. It ain't about us. It's about our future. Thank you. So, <laughs> Tashanti, let me give you something else to chew on here. So, I am looking at my phone. Um, I'm looking at a story this morning from CNN, and I'm going to read a little bit of it. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said Tuesday he opposes paying reparations for slavery, arguing, quote, none of us currently living are responsible, quote, for what he called America's original sin. I don't think reparations for something that happened 150 years ago for whom none of us currently living are responsible is a good idea. The Kentucky Republican told reporters in response to a question about whether reparations should be paid or a public apology should be made by Congress or the President. <laughs> if Lux could speak the way that I was looking at you as you read that speaks values yeah i would say um there it is there that's the issue you know not wanting to um acknowledge um what is pretty evident and then being arrogant enough to publicly say such things furtherly contributes to the harm and the 
division amongst us as people. Um, simply put, simply put. I'm not one of the, I'm, I'm just a straight to the point type person and just simply put, that is exactly why we struggle. That is exactly what the issue is um, and just the arrogance of that, you know, even in any relationship, if we're talking about reconciliation, building um, forgiveness, it cannot, that cannot take place without acknowledgement, without removing the ego. Um, I say that all the time. I tell organizers this, I tell my kids this, I, I tell my husband this, you know, if, if um, insecurities, because to me, that was like an insecurity speaking, guilt through insecurity, loudly, like, eh, eh. it was like a loud, when you were reading it, I just heard it in my head, like, eh. yeah, no, you got to go do some work. Um, but insecurities and ego is, is, is off the chain, you know, and it's one of the reasons why we cannot progress um, as a people and as a nation, because people are not managing their insecurities and ego um, in regards to um, building relationships, so. And now for something completely different, um, but, not in, but not entirely. Right? So um, there, there's a tension in everything that we do, and there's a deep and powerful tension that has been really evident in what you've all said so far. Um, which is between where we are and where we'd like to be and what as a practical matter, because for all of us, these, these are not abstract questions. We're not chopping logic. This is work we're all trying to do, right? Um, and Jesse and I were part of something that began in, in the last years of the Obama administration. Um, partly because of the work of Jeremy Travis and Carol Mason, who were with us yesterday, um, who conceived of and launched something called the National Initiative for Building Community Trust and Justice. And it has a couple of different elements in it, which Jesse will speak to, but one of them uh, was reconciliation. And it, it, it was very deliberately a vehicle for trying to figure out in, in a real and practical way uh, how to grapple with the issues and the tensions and the realities that we have been talking about. Um, and it's no surprise that given the magnitude of those issues and tensions and realities um, that what you're about to hear does not rise to the level of what we know is required here. Um, but as you've all said, you go home and you do work and you try to make things better and this, this, this was a thing like that. And so Jesse, lay that out for us. Sure, I'll do, my, I'll do my best. And I have to say, I was very curious to see how you were going to do that transition <laughs> to what I was going to say from where we are. So hopefully I can at least pick up on some of the threads and add something um, helpful to the conversation. I think the National Initiatives work has come up in a number of different spaces here at the conference, so I won't say too much about it. Uh, six city demonstration project funded by the US Department of Justice in the previous administration, trying to do deliberate work and intensive work right at the issue of the lack of trust between communities most affected, particularly communities of color, and law enforcement in ways that I did the acknowledgement of what the history had been and the way Ms. Braden was talking about that was doing some real work to try and, you know, change and skill build around procedural justice and other things the way police were doing their business, but also in different ways to bring communities and law enforcement together in a deliberate reconciliation process. I said six places to name them specifically. There's Birmingham, Alabama, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Gary, Indiana, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Fort Worth, Texas, and Stockton, California. Um, our role at the Urban Institute was to be an evaluator around this to try as much as we could as this work was being done, as invention was being done, to start creating some knowledge and some evidence about what was accomplished. And what I wanna speak to the most was work that we did 
around community surveying because so much of what it was trying to do was to move the needle a little bit on trust, on feelings of legitimacy, on feelings that the police were there for the communities where crime and violence was most present and where so much harm had been done in many ways by policing for, for, for decades and decades, if not hundreds of years. And so what we did in pursuit of that, or one of the things we did, is go in and ask people um, in neighborhoods in all six cities, not across the entirety of the city. What we did is deliberately try and go to the places where policing was most present, where we knew those relationships had been most painful and difficult. The way we tried to do that is, you know, we created an, an index using crime, using calls for service, using concentrated poverty. And so we took the the blocks, the top 10% of residential blocks in every one of those six cities. And that's where we uh, drew the sample and we went out and knocked on doors. And I'm saying we, I want to acknowledge uh, the Urban League of Pittsburgh, the Urban League of Birmingham, Gary Neighborhood Services, the Urban League in Minneapolis, One Safe pa Place in Fort Worth, and Fathers and Families of San Joaquin, uh, in Stockton, who were our partners and helped us identify and bring in a team of people from those communities to go out and do the surveys, who worked tirelessly to knock on doors and engage people to answer what were some really difficult questions about how they saw police and the law, and they worked so hard, and it was wonderful uh, to work with them to gather some of the information I'm going to talk to you about. So we talked to uh, over 1,200 people uh, at two points in time, one in 2015, right at the beginning of the National Initiative's work, and again in 2017, not at the end of it, but when a lot had been done in the six cities. And the first thing that I would lay out from that, and this probably won't surprise people, but the levels of mistrust uh, in the police were very, very high in these communities. Only 30% of the people that we talked to said that they personally trusted the police. Only 26% of them thought that police made fair and impartial decisions when they were dealing with people. The majority of people we talked to, 56%, believe that police treat people differently because of their race or ethnicity. Um, in my mind, this connects to the next thing I'm gonna to say to the question of over-policing and under-policing that Ms. Braden laid out. Um, when you ask people, is the police department responsive to community concerns, only 28% of people thought that they were. The same percentage, when you ask them, do the police prioritize the problems that are most important to your community? Only 28% thought that they did. So you could really see this misalignment from the community's perspective of what the police are out there doing and what they want and need. And finally, um, on some of the basics, I mean, we talk about trust building as a piece of reconciliation. Um, you can't have trust where people aren't trustworthy, where institutions aren't trustworthy. And when you think about trustworthiness, we asked, you know, do you think the police are honest? Only 24% of the people we talked to agreed that the police were honest. And only 24% of the people we talked to believe that the police departments held people, held their own accountable for wrong and inappropriate conduct in the community. So came in here, and again, you know, I think this is a reality that lots of people in the room are aware of, but to put those kind of numbers, and I think particularly striking the degree to which people in the community said, we don't think the police are honest, and we don't think that they hold their own accountable. Hugely challenging. Alongside that, um, we were asking people how they thought about the law and their willingness to engage in various ways um, with the police or with the system in order to control crime. And for all that that I just said, three quarters of the people we talked to either agreed or strongly agreed that all laws should be obeyed. 71% of the people we talked to said they were likely or very likely to call the police to report a crime. 64% to provide information to help find a suspect. 53% to attend a community meeting to discuss crime in, in their neighborhood with the police. And these aren't surprising things for the community to say in general, but I do think when you put them alongside the picture that they are providing about what policing looks like in their communities, when you put those two things alongside each other, I think it is surprising the level of willingness to engage or you know, to have, I mean, maybe to say to have faith 
in the law is too much, but certainly not to have given up on that. And I think part of the idea of the national initiative was there was real potential there. And when you talk about trying to build the coalition necessary to really address a problem like violence, you need to try and unlock and build the kind of progress and trust that's necessary to access the potential partnership that I think that that implies. And, you know, over the two years between our survey waves, I think there was a tremendous amount of work done within the police departments around reconciliation, again, doing the acknowledgement of historical harm and having some really difficult conversations and challenging ones that were translated into policy changes in the six cities. And so when we came back in 2017 and asked the same questions, um, we were, I know I was really surprised when we looked at the results at how much improvement there was across essentially all of these domains when you looked across the six cities. Now I will say that was an uneven story, not every city. I think in four of the six cities we saw improvement on at least some things, in two of them we didn't. In fact, in one of the cities uh, things got worse in terms of perceptions. But one of the things I think we took out of that is it's early, but I think at least some hopeful evidence that doing deliberate work to try and bridge that gap is possible in terms of making progress. But what I do want to leave with, because I think that that is very heartening and certainly for everybody who put in all the work in the National Initiative cities to try and move that, process, that progress, it's very heartening. But I would come back to those two that I highlighted around the percentage of people saying the police are honest and that they hold their own accountable. That got better but neither of them got to 30%. And so we do have this situation where it looks like some progress was made, but the progress was made from a very difficult starting point. And so I think we have the evidence that there is promise in doing that kind of deliberate and intensive work, but I think I wanna lay that alongside the recognition that in those cities it looks like some progress down the road to a better place was made, but we're still very early in that journey and there's a long, long way to go. So David, I hope that that was a helpful, something completely different in the conversation. Uh, I, I found it so. Um, and, and let me reflect on that a little bit and tell a story. So the, the National Initiative was constructed of several ideas that were at the time and are still um, very high up in the world of, of policing and, and researchers interested in policing community relationships. Um, those being procedural justice, um, implicit bias, and reconciliation. And there was a cast of thousands working on this project, but the reconciliation piece was particularly vested in the national network. Um, so the idea was that by, by working with departments and communities on improving procedural justice, addressing implicit bias, and frankly trying to figure out what reconciliation would look like, that progress could be made. Um, and not entirely, not to our surprise, it turns out that progress was made, which is really encouraging. So in, in, in the world of what we can do immediately, that, that world has just gotten a little bit better. The reconciliation, so, so I want to dwell on both reconciliation and Stockton. Um, and I've gotten permission from the Stockton folks to talk about this, so I'm, I'm, I'm not violating any confidences here. Um, but the, the idea of, of reconciliation was, and, and again, uh, Maisha Braden articulated this really well, which is that whatever it is we're dealing with right now did not happen right now. Not all of it by any means. And um, our, our friend and colleague, Pastor Ben McBride, who works in, in Oakland, um, and many people in this room know, know Ben, uh, teaches this to recruits coming into the Oakland Police Department. And what he says is, when, when you walk in your uniform in my community, my community does not see you for who you are. We see you for what your institution represents. And the line he uses to try to get this across is, history has stolen your identity. 
which is really powerful. And the, the notion behind reconciliation was that 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 reality is so profound that it cannot be dealt with by looking only at what's going on today. We, we have to go back and we have to go deeper. Um, and we all talk like this, but, but Jesse was talking about the survey results and what they said about uh, the policing as it was being practiced in the community. And one of the points here is that it's not just about policing as it is practiced now in the community. That's important. But the collective experience of the community with policing is not about what's happening just right now. Um, and just to, to read ahead a little bit, right after this, we will be honored in one of the panels by the presence of acting NYPD Commissioner Benjamin Tucker, who is going to talk about the apology that, that his, his boss, the Commissioner of the New York Police Department, made last week um, to the LBGQTI community in New York City for the NYPD's role in the Stonewall incident. Right, so the, the, the hope here is that by taking on that historical experience, something important could happen. So here's the story. Uh, I had the great good fortune to be the one who went to Stockton and said this to the middle ranks in the Stockton Police Department. Um, and I have spent a lot of years saying difficult things to police officers, and I'm good at it, and I almost, get away, almost always get away with it. This was not one of those times. <laughs> um, they basically ran me out of town. And they were deeply, profoundly, viscerally angry with me. Because what I had said was, um, communities do not trust the police, affected communities do not trust the police. Here are the reasons why. Um, and their reaction was, not here. This, this is a good police department. The, the, the bad things you're talking about may happen elsewhere, and because you're saying it, we believe it. Um, but we find it hard to believe because we would not tolerate those things. Um, and the, the folks internally who were committed to the NI kind of got me out of the room and said, get out of here. We can probably salvage this, but we, we don't want you here anymore. Um, and then Urban did those initial surveys. And the gulf between, in Stockton, California, respect for the law, desire to be safe, um, willingness to work with the police, willingness to have a relationship with the police, and a profound lack of trust and confidence in the police was glaring. And Jesse and I ended up on a phone with um, senior people in the Stockton Police Department, and they were bereft. They were shocked by this. And what we ended up saying to them was, we will take you at your word that yours is a good police department, and we will take you at your word that you would not do these things that you find so abhorrent. This is still the reality. And what we tried to tell you months ago was history has stolen your identity. And unless you deal with that, the experience and the views of the community for the police is not about you and yours and what has happened in the last 18 months or five years. Right, as Maisha said, it is deep. And I want I want to ask the Stockton folks a question, and then I want to ask Gladys a question, and then I want to bring all of you in. Uh, but to, to, to Tashante and, and the Stockton folks, Chief Jones, along with some of his top people, then undertook a deliberate attempt to do reconciliation work in Stockton. So tell us a little bit about that and what it felt like and what you think it meant. Um, so, I attended a town hall um, that Chief Jones and Captain Meadows and a couple of others in our city um, put on at Progressive. It was, it's a church in Stockton. 
And when Chief got up there, he began to talk about the history um, of harm um, within, you know, communities, between communities and law enforcement in front of all these people. And I was like, wow, oh, okay. And he literally gave a public apology um, on behalf of the um, department. And to some, you may think, ah, oh, yeah, that, that, that sounds good, because I thought the same thing, right? And then um, it was what took place after the fact. It was um, the call to do listening sessions and have what I call courageous conversations between law enforcement and community. And I thought that was, I was like, oh, that's, that's fine. That's, that, that sounds like something. Okay, so we'll see. We're going to have a conversation. And so I um, had the opportunity to organize a couple of those conversations. And I'm like, okay, it was a conversation. So I thought that it would end there. Uh, but no, there were actually action items that were literally put on a list. And uh, Chief Jones, we still, to this day, we have a check-in on Monday. Um, we began to have our check-ins, and, and he literally would check off the list of action items that were discussed in a couple of those conversations. And for me, um, that was a big deal. Because it's one thing, you see a lot of, especially with when you're talking about law enforcement or systems, you see a lot of what I call one-hitter quitters. Well, they'll come through, here's coffee with the cops, or, you know, this is what we're doing today, and then there is no follow-up. That was not the case in that situation. A lot of the things that we, um, a lot of the action items that, that were put in place in a lot of those listening sessions are still going on today. The very first ever uh, policy advisory board was created and ran by community members. The very first policy advisory board um, was created within SPD and ran by community members. We literally sat down at a table and went through all of the policies and were able to speak to the changes that needed to be made um, from the perspective of community members. And that's not, no, that's not a little thing. Like, that's a big thing. Um, and so many other just the breaking silence movement that we started um, and going through communities and, and blending the conversations and creating the spaces of um, just community and allowing community members to begin to see law enforcement um, as a part of the community because they are a part of our community and also reminding them that, you know, you are a part of the community and we have to work together. There have been you know, the opportunities for others to go from the community to go into the PJ classes and the impl implicit bias classes. Um, I was one of the first community members to be able to do that. And I remember sitting in there thinking, this is very interesting stuff. Like, but I'm only one person. So there needs to be more people who you allow to come into this space. And then we took it to another level once we got an implicit bias. And I was like, it's... It was interesting to see um, a white officer talk about black history or the history of harm. That was really interesting. Um, and they were down to have a dialogue about what that was like and how maybe you should include community members and allow them to facilitate those classes with you. Or uh, maybe you shouldn't even be, maybe this should be being done in the community, which is scary, you know, to law enforcement who, in spending time with them, just like we don't have trust with them, they don't have trust with us too. And so in spent, it, it, was, it, was, it was a trip, for lack of a better term, to see how a lot of our feelings were mirrored. We felt the same way about each other as community how we feel about law enforcement, how law enforcement felt about community. And I could literally do a whole dissertation on the experience and what it was like and how powerful um, it has been, e even in the midst of the things that don't go well. You know, there was an incident that took place a couple of weeks ago and Chief Jones literally called me and was just, uh, felt a little just beat down. And I'm like, hey, you know, you have to 
stay focused and keep your, as my grandma, my mom always tell me, keep your eye on the prize and what the main goal is and those hiccups that come along the way, such as with the experience that we had, um, are reminders to take it to another level. Um, and so the, we, wouldn't be, we wouldn't be able to have that type of conversation or relationship had the, uh, those reconciliation conversations hadn't taken place and, the, and acknowledging harm um, through there. And it just proves that, you know, we're on the right track. You know, I may be gone in, in my grave and, and not, on, not walking on earth anymore, when, when we see the big shifts, but it's definitely proof that the work that is being done is necessary, it is powerful, and it is effective. Tony, you want to add anything to that? Um, to be honest, I believe that Tashante really covered um, logistically the, the, the bulk of uh, what's being done there from the PJ implicit bias, um, um, the PJ3 training um, that's going out in the communities, co-facilitating that, the history of policing that's taking place, um, uh, rolling it out to the community, bringing community into those spaces. Um, um, the only thing that um, I even added to that was from a faith-based organizing perspective, uh, wanting to ensure that uh, clergy were included in that um, and that congregation members then were included in that um, and in the conversations and the trainings um, to uh, broaden it out into the, the city. Um, one thing that did come to mind um, when you were when you were uh, going over the information, um, I went, my first training that I went through, history of policing, I've gone through several of the PJ training, training trainers, all of that, I love it. Um, I, I love it. I love the environment, I love the, I didn't at first. At first I was like, I need my collar on um, while y'all got y'all uniform on, shoot, I need to, you know, put on my uniform and come in here too, because you know, it's a little un intimidating. Um, but building relationships, it it uh, it took away from the um, intimidation of the uniform, uh, which by default I think is what needed to be built up um, was the relationship. History of policing. I will never forget this conversation with Captain Metters. He did the entire training. Um, I thought it's a stellar training. I love the material, all of that um, triggering up and down roller coasters um, for of, the, of a flood of emotions, and then just the epiphany. The epiphany for me was, hmm. So you've been used to uphold laws that were not necessarily in my best interest. Hmm. Well, I don't know how I'm feeling about that. I had to really think about it because you're not making the law. You're just upholding the law. You're doing the dirty work for some of the laws that you may not even agree with. But that uniform and that badge require you to. And I wanted to test the theory out. <laughs> so I, well, I mean, that's me. I'm, I'm gonna, why be in the room if I can't challenge it? So I'm going to test this theory out. Let me ask the question. So now we have relationship, Captain Metters. And I mean, I email and just send you prayers and, you know, and I'll call. And uh, Captain Metters is amazing. He's an amazing man. And so is the chief and all of them. Absolutely, I promise you, they are stellar individuals. And I have a sincere love for them. My concern was, I know that you genuinely love and appreciate Elder Tony. Should the White House decide they don't like Elder Tony and develop a law that says anybody that look like Elder Tony, <laughs> I just have to make up, you know, crazy stuff. Six foot one, certain weight, because I'm not telling y'all my weight. Six foot one, a certain weight, certain skin color, talks in a certain kind of way, and they actually designed this law that says anyone that looks like her, now I need you to arrest her and hold her, or whatever that could be, we can fill in the blanks for what that policy was. Would you still love me? Even if you knew I'd done nothing wrong? 
even if you knew that was an unjust law, even if you knew that it would cost my family, cause harm to my family, all of, because in essence, if we're gonna sit at the table and have courageous conversation, if we're really gonna talk about what this is, the history of police, and if we're really gonna dig deep like that into it, David, the truth of the matter is, the minute that you put this uniform on, we know that it's attached to history, but when we look at that history, then we have to deal with and grapple with the fact that history has not been kind to my people. History has not been kind to us at all. The laws that have been implemented have not been kind to us. And now I see that you also were used to uphold those laws. So how do I trust the entity, the very entity that's been, how do I trust beyond the relationship? How do I trust that? Because that thing's fragile. It could change at any it could change at any moment until they actually say, okay, we're going to be a part of this policy. We're going to be a part of the conversation that says, no, that's not just, that's not right. Because until that happens, truth be told, I don't know whether or not this trust thing is fragile enough to, it, it, it might change at any moment. It could change tomorrow, depending on who decides is going to take, well, not tomorrow, but it could change in 2020. It could change four years from there, depending on whatever the next campaign is, whatever the next thing is that says, now the narrative is this person. That person is now the criminal. So we have to really take that in there. And I know, I feel it. I felt a shift. I felt a heaviness when I said it. But that's, that's my reality. That's my reality. This time right now, the narrative says that somebody else is a criminal. Because history has already said I've been a criminal long enough so that you've already been programmed that. And I've been conditioned. That was the other thing. And I'm being elongated. I'm going to let it go. When you were saying the, um, you were reading the stats um, and um, they were doing the statistics in regard to law-abiding citizens or what have you. Um, we've been conditioned to be law-abiding citizens. Most of us have. It's a conditioning that has taken place. No, I don't want to break the law. No, most people don't want to break the law in the community because we've been conditioned not to. What happens when people begin to find out that that conditioning that has been put into place is only so that we can submit to further oppression? Then you start seeing some of the things that you see happening in our communities with the younger children that are looking at it and saying, hey, I'm being conditioned to submit to oppression. This is not fair. Because once they put that uniform on, they don't really care about me because it's power. We have to break these cycles that history have painted and that they've created. If we don't, the things that we see now, that fruit's only going to keep growing. So Gladys, I threatened to ask you another question, and I am going to respectfully disrespect you, because we've only got a few more minutes, and I want to make sure that the floor gets some time, so I apologize for that. Um, we do have a few more minutes, and I can't see very well out here, but I believe there are microphones on both sides, and... Uh, as has been said, questions, please, um, not, not speeches. So who'd like to get in on this? So just please say who you are and... and uh... Is this on? Okay. Hi, um, my name is Chrissy Cunningham. I'm an independent trainer and consultant, and I also have a personal history of justice involvement, which brings me to the question. Uh, the question is really about the idea of respecting communities. And to me, that means respecting everyone in the community, including people who have committed crimes and people who have engaged in harmful acts. And I just want to say I want to thank the opening speaker and this panel for not engaging in dehumanizing or stigmatizing terminology and concepts. Unfortunately, I did experience that yesterday at this conference, so I just wanted to raise that. Um, to me, it's really important because I think public safety and safe communities demand respecting the inherent worth of every person in them. So my question to anyone on the panel is, first, do you agree with that concept? And second, how do you then address it in the communities and in reform settings even? Anybody? 
going to attempt to <laughs> respect it. First of all, what you, the whole community deserves respect, including the law enforcement deserves respect because their job is to, to serve and to protect. And, uh, and we feel that the, the, and that's the community's job too, to protect the community, to serve the community. And when that balance comes together, that actually happens. So, you know, that's my answer, it's a short answer, but that actually does happen when the police join hands with the community, it actually does happen and a change does occur for the best. Hi, Michael Green. Um, first of all, thank you for your comments and discussion. It was from the heart and we heard that and so thank you. Um, several years ago, I heard a talk by um, Bessel van der Kolk, who's one of the pioneers in the psychiatrist and treating trauma. And he talked about a trip he made to South Africa to go sit in on the truth and reconciliation hearings. And he made two observations. One, that there was mainly women in the audience. Not too many men, not too many young people. And the second observation he made was that they take regular breaks. Women would break out in song and dance as a way to process on a deep level the trauma of hearing those confessions, these terrible things that were done in South Africa. So my question to you guys is, one, how much are youth involved in these hearings? Because my sense is they're the ones who are most angry um, and haven't fully developed brains, not that they're not smart, and have difficulty processing the kinds of <clears throat> abuse and harassment they experience uh, from and by um, police. And second, how are you all know the community <clears throat> members um, taking steps to process the, the, the trauma that this brings up in terms of the history of policing as well as the current abuses in policing, the self-care aspect about the trauma. So the first thing that came to my mind when you were sharing in regard to the women and stopping in song um, and trauma, childbirth is trauma. Um, <laughs> she went there. <laughs> and so, um, so as a woman, I'm I'm slightly biased. I could be. Um, I just feel like um, in this day and time, what we're finding um, more often than not is that you have women that are um, leading in um, communities, especially black and brown communities where um, there have been uh, deep amounts of trauma. Um, you have women that are uh, stepping forth that are actually using their voice and speaking out and, um, and, 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 and pouring into and nurturing and loving in the communities um, in more profound ways um, because I believe that women just, we, we house trauma differently, um, we, we process trauma differently um, and, and, and we'll function in trauma differently that's not I'm not saying that that's like the best way uh, we have to deal with it however um, it is just something and this is just my opinion that there is just something innately in the essence of a woman that 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 fortifies us to be able to function um, a little longer in trauma in our communities in, in the absence of um, in the absence of uh, the men that have been there over the years um, for different reasons, um, whether it's prison, shooting, just different reasons we've had to function, though, in our communities. Um, in regard to the youth, all I will say is that um, it would depend on the compartment or the area. Um, and I'm going to bounce that more so to Tay, because 
all the youth. My grandson is eight. And when we're looking at youth, what we're learning or what I'm learning from those that are coming out of penal institutes and going out and really wanting to do more work in depth in the community to redirect our youth is that if the youth are being targeted prior to being touched by the system, then there is more actual um, engagement and more hope. And that the younger that the youth are in our communities, the more pure that they are, the more respectful that they are. So whatever gap that there was when there was um, an absence of parenting and, and guardians in black and brown communities um, due to some of the systemic things that were taking place. Um, a little bit of that is being rectified with the millennials. They're leaned in more um, towards rearing up their children and more engaged with helping them to um, understand what's going on. Our teenagers are the ones that we're really needing to target in our communities. Thanks. And probably one more. Oh, my name is Lisa Clemens. I'm a retired Minneapolis police sergeant, and I've been on Facebook just screaming that you have three black women sitting up on this stage, because <laughs> it's not what you see. So I also had an organization called A Mother's Love for empowering African-American mothers, single mothers in the community. So I want to tell you how proud I am to be sitting in this audience and watching you on this stage. Thank you. I wondered that too, David. When I looked around and saw us, I said, wow, what's going on? <laughs> so I was, I was proud of that too, that he had three black women on the stage. And please. Okay, so I have a quick question. I, I tend to ask this question of all panelists um, because I just like to get the diversity um, in the answer. So. You all are, um, do a lot of work close to the ground. So you said the people who are closest to the problem usually have the solutions. And we have a lot of allies that are not African American, but they want to help. And we talk about having them use their white privilege, but a lot of them don't have access to these spaces that us blacks think that they have access to. So what advice would you give those non-African Americans who want to be on the ground organizing and don't have access to those spaces to use their white privilege? Create a space. Create their space so they can have that space. In our community, we, we as an outgrowth of the, um, the safe communities, we created a round table with having ongoing dialogue with the police about you know, what's going on in the community, how we can help them, how they can help us make our community a safer place. And we have voices, Latinos, Asians, young people, old people, whoever can come. We have it at the Civil Rights Heritage Center, and they can come and talk about increasing those positive relationships with law enforcement and the community to keep making our communities a safe place. So create a space or, or move into that space that somebody already got. They, they are part of the community too. Tell them to, you know, get open that and let them in. I want to say something about the, uh, the young people though, because they call me an old person, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but we, we do have to create that space for the young people to come into it. Because they tell me, Ms. Muhammad, when are you gonna sit down? And I said, when you stand up, I can't sit down. So, so we have to create that, create that space, don't we? <laughs> okay. Thank you. So we do have to stop. Could I just ask you to ask your question? And I'm hoping that some of, of the panelists can circle back to you. Actually, it's a, thank you. My name is Philip Simmons from Ceasefire Detroit. Uh, my question is for um, the Urban Institute. I'm curious in regards to the numbers that you guys asked as far as the survey, that, uh, that trust and the attributes, I'm curious what attributes were used um, as far as what race, as far as race, ethnicity, age, uh, male, female, as far as who's asked the question, because I find it a little bit interesting that trust went up after Trayvon Martin and Eric Garner from that aspect of it, that trust went up in these communities after such you know, harsh violence from that aspect of it. So what, what were the attributes that were used? Um, so, so, no. Yeah. Nope. Um, <laughs> you, you, you two can I'll find each other. With you. Will you join me in thanking my panelists, <laughs> our panelists? <laughs>